Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Adrienne Scavera, Training and Outreach Director for Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon, a collaborative partner with the Northwest MHTTC. We would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The Northwest MHTTC honors the many cultures and lands across our region, spanning Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. We want to acknowledge that the Northwest MHTTC, based out of Seattle, sits on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Next, we would like to introduce the MHTTC network. The MHTTC network is a nationwide network that is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Our purpose includes disseminating and implementing evidence-based practices for mental health issues into the workforce. The goals of the network include support mental health-related evidence-based practices, heighten the awareness, knowledge, and skills of the workforce, foster regional and national alliances, provide and connect you to free training and technical assistance. Now about our Northwest MHTTC. The Northwest MHTTC is based at the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. We provide training and technical assistance, or TA, and evidence-based practices to Region 10, including Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Our area of focus is evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis. However, we provide training on a variety of topics, including integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity and equity issues, school mental health, peer support, trauma-informed approaches, and others. Our target workforce includes behavioral health and primary care providers, school and social service staff, and others whose work has the potential to improve behavioral health outcomes for individuals with or at risk of developing serious mental health challenges. How do we fulfill our mission? Live events like this webinar that we also record and post, virtual learning communities, free self-paced online courses, newsletters and our resource library on the website, and connection to other training centers and events. To find out more about our goals, training opportunities, and resources, you can visit our website and sign up for our newsletter. We wanna take a moment to talk about language. It is our intention to always be mindful of using language that promotes recovery and culturally appropriate terminology. We encourage everyone to use language that demonstrates respect for a person's dignity and worth. It is consistent with recovery-oriented practices and promotes environments that foster respect, human dignity, and hope. And we next want to review the logistics regarding, regarding communication during today's webinar. So due to our large audience, all attendees are muted and not appearing on video. The chat is available and everyone can see what is in the chat. And I see a lot of folks are uh, sharing some chat comments. This presentation is being recorded. This recording, as well as the slides, will be made available on our website in a few weeks. And you'll receive an email from Zoom with a link to where those resources will be posted on our website. You will receive an email within two weeks on how to access a certificate of attendance, but there are not formal CEUs available. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please feel free to use the chat and staff from the Northwest MHTTC will assist you. If you have questions that you wanna ask, we will be monitoring the Q&A box to facilitate answering as many questions as possible at the end of our presentation today. So if you have any content related questions, please type them in the Q&A box at any point throughout the webinar. Please avoid putting content questions in the chat box as we aren't able to copy those into the Q&A and we wanna make sure we don't miss them. Our team will moderate and share questions with our presenter. We might provide a short written response during the webinar or field them live as time allows, but we will do our best to get an answer to every question that is asked. Lastly, your feedback is crucial to our work, so we would appreciate your response to a very short survey that takes just a couple minutes after today's webinar. Our team will share that link in the chat box today. You'll also receive an email reminder from Zoom tomorrow. 
We are required by SAMHSA to conduct this survey, and we really appreciate your feedback about this session, as well as helping to plan future sessions. And your participation helps to keep these free trainings coming. And I do want to share that SAMHSA sponsors this work, but does not reflect any official position on this content. And before we introduce our fantastic speaker for today's harm reduction webinar, we'd like to check in with all of you with a couple of polls. And first, we'd love to learn who is here with us today. So I am launching a poll about role and work settings. So you should see that pop up on your screen. Please feel free to answer that. The first question is please choose the option that best describes your role. Behavioral health clinician or therapist, case manager, or outreach worker, education, school or school-based organization, nurse or other medical worker, peer support specialist, clinical supervisor, other. And if you identify with other, please feel free to type your answer in the chat box and we'll take a look at see uh, what the other roles are coming in. The next question in that poll is what is your work setting? Criminal justice or corrections, educational setting, behavioral health clinic or treatment program, shelter or housing program, outpatient healthcare center, peer run program, hospital, and finally other. And if you identify with the other work setting, please feel free to get that reflected in the chat box because we'd love to hear who is with us today. I'm going to leave this poll open for about another 30 seconds. I see we've got a lot of people responding to the poll, which I really appreciate. We're just going to leave it open for a little bit more as we see a, uh, we've got folks represented all across categories, it looks like, for both role setting, role and work setting. I'm going to take a look at the chat here. We've got peer support. We've got uh, substance use disorder professional, warm line program manager. Fantastic. Thank you all for sharing that. All right. So I'm going to close the poll in about five seconds here. So if you haven't had a chance to answer it, now is the time to select which responses are true for you. All right. I am going to be sharing the results so everyone can see who is with us here today. So other is the largest category for the option that best describes your role, about a quarter of us, 26%, followed by at 19%, behavioral health clinician or therapist, then case manager, outreach worker at 18%. We've got 15% of our audience today identifies as peer support specialists. And then we have 11% of our participants are education school or school-based organization, 7% clinical supervisors, and 11% educate, oh, sorry, 4%, <laughs> more than doubled that there, 4% nurse or other medical worker. As far as work setting, a majority, well, not quite a majority, about a third, 32% work in behavioral health clinic or treatment programs. Next, followed by other, which we've got some great responses in the chat box there, and then 13% educational setting, 8% peer run programs, 7% work in hospitals, 5% in criminal justice and corrections, and 13% in educational settings. So thank you all for responding to that. We've got one more poll that I'd love to check in around, which is your familiarity with harm reduction. For this, we've just got one question, which is to please rate your familiarity with harm reduction on a scale of zero to five, with zero meaning no familiarity and five being very familiar. I see the responses are coming in quickly and we've got, it almost looks like uh, an S curve. So we'll see what that ends up looking like as more people respond here going to leave this open for another uh, 10 seconds. So please take a moment to rate your familiarity with harm reduction. It's really going to be a useful uh, poll as we get started here. All right. So I am closing the poll right now. Thank you all for voting. And we have 27% rate themselves highest category at a three, you know, pretty familiar, 4%, 
about a quarter of us getting more towards the very familiar 11% or that five very familiar with harm reduction, the most familiar and 20% two not very familiar one uh, rating themselves at a one 16% of the people here today, not maybe a little bit familiar and 2% of our audience today has no familiarity with harm reduction. So we've really got people across the spectrum of familiarity here. Thank you all so much for responding to that poll. And with that, I would, I'm so pleased to introduce our presenter, Haven Wheelock. Haven has been advocating for the health and safety of people who use drugs since 2002. Currently, she is the Drug Users Health Services Program Coordinator at Outside In in Portland, Oregon. She provides indirect service with people who use drugs and has also been involved in creating policy that improves health in Oregon. She completed a Master of Public Health degree as a fellow at Johns Hopkins as part of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, focusing on overdose and addiction policy. She was also a chief petitioner for Ballot Measure 110, which was a first in the nation initiative to decriminalize drugs in the state of Oregon. Thank you so much for being here today, Haven. I'm now gonna turn it over to Haven and she will share her slides. So I will uh, stop screen sharing here. Great, and I hopefully can make screen sharing happen again. Yes. Bam, bam, did that work? All right, it's looking great. Thanks, Haven. Fantastic. Hey everyone, I'm Haven Wheelock. As has been said, um, I have been working with people who use drugs for a really, really, really long time. Um, I like to start off every conversation I have with folks by thanking y'all for being here, because I think it's really important. Um, taking part in that poll is really helpful. It kind of helps me gauge where I'm at. I hope the 11% of you who said you're very familiar um, don't get really bored, because um, this is a intro to harm reduction, but I hope something good will come out of it for everyone. Um, I start these conversations by saying that I love people who use drugs probably more than most people in general, that I like most people in general. Um, they're some of my favorite people. I've had the honor and privilege of working directly with people primarily who are using and injecting heroin and methamphetamines. Um, I've worked both on the East Coast and on the West Coast doing this work, but I have been with Outside In here in Portland, Oregon for almost 15 years now, um, which is super exciting. Um, is there other important things I need to tell you? I have no financial disclosures. Um, I'm not getting paid. I just hang out and like to talk about drugs more than anything else in the entire world. So um, with that, I guess I will just kind of dive in. And maybe, maybe, yes. So I like to start off these talks talking about kind of where the term harm reduction come fr comes from and where the movement and the energy around harm reduction really, really lies and where it really needs to and sh should continue to like live. Um, oh, didn't mean to do that. So the term harm reduction was really coined out of HIV. And actually, to be honest, I come to this work from HIV. I started this work with a focus on HIV. I actually started doing HIV prevention work in 1998, um, which is a very long time ago. Um, mostly I was in high school and I wanted to talk about sex and drugs and it made my parents mad that I liked talking about sex and drugs. So I became an AIDS activist. Um, so really like the term itself and the concept of harm reduction really started in HIV. It, and it, comes from a place where people who were using drugs were dying of this bloodborne infection and drug users themselves were the ones that were taking care of each other. Um, they were really being left out of the conversations, were really being demonized. Um, and we, as a movement at the time, really had to fight for our own health and to be able to like show up it wasn't till much later, actually, that public health has stepped in and like accepted these concepts. Um, and even now, I would say there's still a lot of pushback on these projects, right? Like West Virginia right now is seeing one of the worst HIV outbreaks in modern history. 
and yet they just passed a law to close syringe exchange in that state. Um, so <laughs> it may seem acceptable in places like Portland where like I don't get a lot of pushback here, but across the country, harm reduction programs are still really under threat. And I think it's important to remember where we come from and that activist spirit. Um, just to explain these three, these three photos, um, the silence equals death photo, that's ACT UP, which is, um, was a really active HIV um, organization fighting for medication for HIV for, to actually bring HIV into like the conversation around health. Um, this is them shutting down the FDA. The center picture is one of my heroes and mentors, Dave Purchase. He, that is actually him at the first legal syringe exchange um, in Tacoma, Washington. That's how, that's our roots. The last picture is of an organization called Bandu, which is a drug users union in Vancouver, Canada, that essentially is probably the reason we have safe consumption spaces in Canada. So this all kind of started in like the late 80s, early 90s. And I think it's important to remember the political context of the time. Um, so when, so we've got HIV cases going up, we've identified that people who use drugs are, and people who inject drugs are at an increased risk for HIV. All of this is going on at the same time as the war on drugs and the war on people who use drugs um, is wrapping up. That creates this new set of like, it created this like weird divide between caring for people who use drugs and not caring about people who use drugs, right? So we were seeing like, this rhetoric around we need to lock up black and brown people because they use drugs um, really targeted and really like hitting hard as we're seeing this like huge health consequence of drug use. And it made it for a long time really hard to like think about drug use as like a health issue. Um, luckily we're starting to move away from that but you know, at the beginning and at the roots of the harm reduction movement, it really was always about pushing back on this idea that people who use substances aren't worthy of care, that need, they need to be locked up, that they need to be put away. Um, outside in, the syringe exchange that I run is the third oldest legal syringe exchange in the country. Portland, Oregon was one of the first cities in the country that said it was okay for us to like give people syringes that need syringes. Um, and that was in 1989. Um, there was another thing. Oh, um, that's, that's enough of that. But I like, oh, I remember. Um, so I use the term legal syringe exchange very intentionally. Um, and that is really to call out and honor all of the people who use drugs, who, have always been working to take care of each other and always like have been trying to do what they can to help preserve people's health, right? Like people, even currently today, there are illegal syringe exchange ha syringe exchanges happening across the country. Um, it may not be legal, but people are, are actively taking care of themselves. So like my program is completely above board. I am glad I can be, outspoken like this and talking to a bunch of people about the work I do, there are programs operating in this country right now that can't do that. Um, and so I am very intentional to honor that because those people are brave and they deserve to be honored. So next one. Um, so I think at the end of the day, harm reduction is grounded in public health. It's grounded in the idea that we wanna keep people happy healthy, safe, disease-free, not dead. Um, but it's also has always been a social justice movement. It is a movement that acknowledges that the war on drugs is a war on black and brown people. Um, poverty plays a role in all things that are coupled into addiction. Um, trauma is at the root of substance use disorder. Um, and what we can do on a society level to improve that is very much a part of the harm reduction movement. Um, we really started our work in HIV. Um, so when the movement really started, it was really focused on 
preventing the spread of HIV, caring for people who had HIV. Um, you know, when I started doing this work in 2002, I was in New York City. At that point, 50% of everyone who was injecting substances in New York City had an HIV infection, 50%. Um, syringe access and programs like the programs we run have reduced those numbers dramatically, which is amazing. Um, but I like, I like to like kind of put that into context. Like 2002 was not that long ago. Um, and we were looking at huge disparities. And then we discovered hepatitis and the link to injection drug use and hepatitis C. Um, for folks that don't know, hepatitis C is another bloodborne infection um, that causes liver failure as well as liver cancer for folks. Um, primarily at this point being driven at least in the US by injection drug use. Um, globally, that's a little different, but in the US, new infections are often associated with injection drug use. And even more recently than that, we are um, assuming many folks on this call know this already, but we are in the middle of the worst overdose crisis we've ever seen in this country. Um, 93,000 people died in 2020 from um, drug overdose, and that's up 30% from 2019. Um, it's terrifying and it's heartbreaking, um, and it doesn't have to be that way. So a lot of our work now is around still doing HIV prevention and hepatitis C prevention and um, all of that, but we also are dealing with this overdose crisis and it's a lot. So um, again, as I said earlier, I'm not gonna repeat it, but equity and like empowerment are, empowerment's not the right word, equity and like inclusion and building up of people is at the heart of the work that we do. So what is harm reduction? I am not going to read this slide. <laughs> um, I feel like that's fine. This is the definition from the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, I really like this definition. I think it really encompasses a lot of the work we do. I do always kind of pause um, with this statement about meeting people where they're at. Um, I think that, you know, in the before times, when we would all be in a room, I would say something like, how many people, like somebody define harm reduction and someone would raise their hand and be like, it's about meeting people where they're at. And that is true, right? But I also don't think it tells the full story of what we do in the harm reduction world. Because yes, it very much is about meeting people where they're at, but it's also active. And it's about meeting people where they're at and not leaving them there right? Um, I'll meet you where you are. And if you want to step forward with me, let's do that. Let's step forward together. And if you don't, then I'm just not going to leave you there. I'm going to be there with you, standing by you through everything, if I can help it. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, rooted in this like radical love that just is one of my favorite things. And not leaving people behind is really important because under our long history of like dehumanizing of people who use substances, they've been left alone a lot. And it's really great to be part of making that change for folks. All right, so the principles. Again, I'm not gonna read the slide, but... Um, you know, like this is kind of like the theory of harm reduction. We'll go into some tools here in a little bit, but these are like the theory. And the things that I love the most, right, is like really honoring people's health and their dignity. You know, I see a meme that goes around every once in a while in my like harm reduction circle that like being on drugs does not mean you shouldn't have safety. Being on drugs means you shouldn't be denied food. Um, just because somebody is using doesn't mean that they don't deserve dignity. Um, and so being able to like do that and provide that like really does go a long way for folks. Um, 
the next three are all about people, right? And it's like, and this is where it gets like tricky when you run a program and you have to like set boundaries and you have to like being person centered and being equitable for all participants can can be a little messy. I'm not going to lie. Right. Um, but, you know, it really is about the person I'm working with in the moment. Right. Like if I am having a conversation with someone and they're like, I'm never going to stop doing methamphetamines, but I really want to stop smoking cigarettes. That's awesome. <laughs> like winning more people die from cigarettes than die from methamphetamines, my friend. Um, let's see what we can do to help get you moving in that direction. Let's work together on a plan. Um, it really is about centering what people want and building up that autonomy. Um, one of my favorite quotes of all times is a little taste of dignity can lead to an entire appetite for self-care. And I think that like by being person-centered, it can really build that in and build that up and like change people's thinking. <clears throat> the other things that I, the other two things on this list are both things actually I love a lot as well. Right. Like I love that the harm reduction community has spent a long time being really honest about the fact that like how drugs are treated in our society are very rooted in white supremacy. Um, it is messy. Like me as a college educated white lady are going to have very different access to health care, to drug treatment to all kinds of things than someone who is not, who doesn't look like me. Um, and that has been like, it's just the reality of it, right? Poor people have less access than people with more money. Um, and being really honest and transparent that like the traumas that our folks are bringing with them look very different and are really complex. and by using a harm reduction framework, you get to work in that and feel where there's there's room there's room for positive change, right? Any positive change is great positive change. Um, and so we while we can't fix like all of the big cultural things, acknowledging that it's real and finding those fixes is really it makes it feel so much more winning, like we're winning more because we know that we are dealing with this really, people are messy. People are messy. People are complex. They got a lot going on. Um, and the harm reduction principles really guide us to like embrace that messy and have that messy be a good, I, like, I love the gray area. I love complicated. I, I, I've always been a puzzle person. I love untying knots. Um, so like making sure that like, that complexity is there is one of my most favorite parts. Um, and the last point is like, harm reduction is really realistic, right? Um, you could hand me a magic wand tomorrow and say, Haven, here is the cure for addiction. And I would take it and I would run around trying to tap the heads of everyone who wants to be tapped. I'm not tapping people who don't. Um, consent is important, but I could run around with that wand and it's still going to take a lot of time to reach people. And in that time, people are going to be dying and they're going to be needing care and they're going to be needing services. We know, I mean, for a very, very long time, Oregon has ranked 50th in the nation for access to mental health and addiction services. So even if every client that walks through the door of our syringe access program wanted to engage in treatment, I couldn't get them in. I just couldn't. Um, and so you know, in lieu of there being like on-demand care for everyone always, like we need something to help keep people safe and healthy. Um, and that's something that harm reduction really, really does. Um, I guess I'm going to see if there's any questions before rolling into some of the tools of harm reduction. Yes, thank you so much, Haven. You've shared so much information that is 
so helpful. And I really can, can feel your passion for this work. So a question did come up regarding, well, really asking if you could speak more to the connection between white supremacy that you were just talking about when looking at the harm reduction principles. Yeah. I mean, I hope I'm answering this question correctly. Um, and I, if I'm, I'm not a perfect person. So if I don't answer it correctly, great. Um, I mean, so we know that when the war on people who use drugs, um, began the Nixon administration knew very well that the, they were going to create mass incarceration, um, in our society. Like they knew that it was going to lead to like if you look at prison rates in this country from pre-war on people who use drugs to current, the, it's shocking and appalling. Um, they also knew that they were intentionally going to target black and brown communities with that work. Um, that was just, they were politically minded. It's been stated, like we have public records that this was a known consequence that they were okay with doing. Um, Throughout history, the war on people who use drugs has escalated really until very re recently, um, both under Democratic and Republican presidents. Um, it's been only not that long ago when some of those policies started to shift and some of those thinking started to shift. Um, and, you know, I think white supremacy also plays a role in if we look at our healthcare system and how our healthcare systems are designed, how they are implemented, um, if we look at the history of healthcare experimentation on people of color, it's really evident um, that, like, that is a part of it is a system that is in place that deserves being called out. I am not an expert in all the ways that white supremacy impacts a culture. Um, I'm trying to learn as much as I can, but I have learning still to do. So um, do you think that answered the question? Yeah, Did thanks Haven. So I have asked for clarification with the person who asked the question as well. I believe they might uh, type a follow-up or pose a question. So I'll just keep an eye out for that. Great. And I do see we have um, some folks with raised hands. So I'd just like to remind people due to our audience size, we do ask that you ask any content related questions in the Q and A box that is gonna be available at the bottom of your screen with the two little conversation blurb items and it says Q and A. And then there's also the chat box if you have questions about technology or logistics or those type of things. Or if you have a comment that you want others to hear or share, because I think especially in this topic, I'm sure there are people in this room who can speak to white supremacy, um, probably better than me. Um, <laughs> but I feel like it's important for it to be called out as part of the paradigm we live in right now. So um, yeah, if people, if it's a comment that like chats are all like the Q and A, I don't think other people get to see, right? We just see that. I believe everyone can see okay. the Q &A. So either way. Yes. Awesome. Is, is there any other questions or should I ju jump in? I am not today? seeing any other questions. I think we might have a couple pending. So there might be some that, that come through. We built in so much time for questions because yes. I like, I would rather like have answer questions than do slides any day. So, um, all right. So let's jump into some tools and what we like, what we actually like, I think, the theory is really important. The framework, the lens is really important. I also think the tools are pretty important. So um, first and foremost, I think the most important tool is respecting people, being kind, being loving, um, being kind to people, even when they're not being kind to you, which is often very hard. <laughs> um, you know, I think that at the end of the day, like, kindness and dignity and respect and like treating humans as someone that deserves that um, can be really helpful. And it goes, it goes a long way to building um, 
therapeutic relationships. Um, in the mental health world, um, it's evidence-based practice to build therapeutic relationships with people. It's actually not necessarily considered a evidence-based practice in the world of addictions, but I really, having done a bunch of looking, I can't, I just don't think we've studied it in addiction specific. Um, and I can tell you from lots of experience that like building relationships with people and like building community with people goes a long way to like giving people the space to like ask questions and like learn ways to be healthier, learn ways to change behavior. Um, you know, having like taking this, like, I don't, your use is not something I'm going to judge approach um, allows people to really like not have to like dig their feet in, right? Like if, if you come to someone and you're like, I, so example, I am a smoker. I smoke cigarettes. I smoke lots of cigarettes, to be honest. Um, the pandemic has not been good for my smoking habit. Um, anytime someone's like, Haven, hey, you need to get quit smoking cigarettes. My first thought is, duh, it's bad for me. My second thought is, yeah, I'm going to light a cigarette, right? Um, people like to dig their feet in when they feel pressured to do things. And by being able to like sit with people and like, we use a lot of motivational interviewing where it's like, oh, okay, I hear you saying this. Is this what you mean, right? What is? What about this? And so we really do engage actively with people around like kind of what they're using and who they are and what they care about and how they're using. Um, it's not uncommon for someone to be like, I want to quit. And my next question is, great. Do you have a plan yet? let's talk about it, right? Like they may have just been like casually dropping that they're thinking about it. But if like me or someone on my team is like, okay, let's talk it through. I mean, I have clients that I have made hundreds of plans with. And sometimes it takes 101 conversations about what a plan would look like before someone acts. And really like giving people the space to like toy with that and tease it out and ask questions and learn things on their own timeline um, is a really great way of like building trust and building community and building resiliency for folks. Um, a lot of times like just a like just having that space and that kindness can really go a long way to improve health. Um, and I don't want to say that it's always easy, right? Like because it's not, um, to be honest. Like, it's really hard to hold like unconditional positive regard for folks when they're calling you names, um, which happens sometimes. Um, but I think it's really important and uh, really like the most important tool that we have in our harm reduction tool belt is really respecting people's decisions about what they do, why they do it, how they do it, and then helping them like change behaviors that they're interested in changing. I think this is the one that most people are most familiar with, right? Syringe access. Um, syringes are an important tool in preventing the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, I often joke that it is much easier in terms of preventing HIV to get people to use new syringes than it is to get them to use condoms. Um, if nothing else, using a new syringe feels better than using a used syringe. So um, this is what brings people in the door, to be honest. Like people, I, I would love to think that people come just for our lovely personality and my wonderful staff and for like the warm, happy feels that people get when they come into our spaces. Really, they're common for new injection equipment. <laughs> um, this photo actually is about a month's worth of syringes that we go through here in our exchange. Um, it's, it's important. We know that having access to new syringes lowers HIV rates. It lowers, and, and all harm reduction services, but HIV and hepatitis C rates decline in places that have access to new injection equipment. Um, overdose rates decline in places that have access to new equipment. Recovery rates improve in places that have harm reduction services. 
Um, because we just give people a space to be and to ask questions and to learn and to get resources. Um, new injection equipment also can save hospital costs by quite a lot, actually. Um, we recently were looking at, we recently published here in Oregon, a study of skin and soft tissue infections, severe bacterial infections that lead to hospitalizations, looking at um, trends over time in terms of just the number and the costs of hospitalizations due to injection related behavior. And it's pretty appalling and heartbreaking. Um, when you're, even if you're not sharing your injection equipment, your risk for skin reusing syringes increases your risk for um, bacterial infections, um, things like endocarditis, which is an uh, infection to the lining of the heart, osteomyelitis, which is bone infections. Um, sepsis, which is blood infections associated with injection drug use. And those, like endocarditis, you could be hospitalized for weeks, six, seven weeks in the hospital on IV antibiotics. It's, it's a really serious infection and we're seeing rates increase, at least here in Oregon, um, pretty exponentially um, due to injection drug use. So new needles are really, really important. Needle exchange saves lives. Um, our exchange takes in over 2 million syringes every year, hands out about the same. Um, we're serving about 4,000 unique clients annually at this point. Pandemic lowered our numbers a bit because that's what the pandemic did. Um, other things that are less obvious and that the healthcare community likes to take over as part of um, thinking about harm reduction Testing is really actually a harm reduction intervention. Um, so testing for um, diseases like HIV, hepatitis C, I would add that syphilis should be on this slide um, as well. We don't currently test for syphilis, but we should be. Um, people, the research really indicates that if people, when people get tested, they change their behavior um, and tend not necessarily permanently, mind you, um, that, that window of time changes how long an intervention like getting a test do, done um, does change the behavior, like how, for how long people reduce their risks after testing really is variable, but it does actually help people reduce some of their risks. And some of that's just education and like being, learning new things about how to reduce your risk for things like HIV and hepatitis, but also if you test positive for other, either of those infections, um, there's treatments available for both. And the sooner we can get people treated, the less likely they are to spread those infections to others. So with HIV, actually, if you're taking HIV medications, you can get your viral load down to, um, it's called, we call it undetectable. So when they pull your blood, they don't see HIV in it. Um, you stop taking your meds, it's coming back. But, and if actually you, if you have an undetectable viral load, you actually can't share HIV. Um, so it's really important to get people who have HIV on medication, not just because we don't want people to die of HIV, which is also very, very true, but from a public health lens, it's a way to decrease spread of HIV. And same with hepatitis. The, the term is secondary prevention in case anyone wants a public health nerd word. Um, but, and with hepatitis C, we actually have like treatments that are, no one likes to use the word cure, but they're incredibly effective in eliminating hepatitis C for folks, um, which is really cool. It's, they're relatively new medications, but you can actually like take eight to 12 weeks of medicine and then not have hepatitis C anymore. Um, and again, that gets back to like one, we don't want people to die of liver cancer. Two, um, again, you're not gonna give it to anyone else if you no longer have those infections. So testing is really a really great harm reduction tool. Medicines for addiction. Um, it's funny, as like the treatment and recovery community has grown and is growing and is changing, like there was a time not that long ago that being on medications like buprenorphine and methadone weren't considered being in treatment. 
um, there are still treatment providers operating throughout this country that do not allow people to be on medication for um, like approved medications that work to treat substance use disorders. Um, so like for a long time, this was harm reduction and I'm not giving it up. I know people want it want to call these things treatment, I'm calling them harm reduction, um, mostly because I actually don't think there's any difference between treatment or harm reduction. We're just a continuum of care for people who use substances. And people, it's not necessarily a linear path either. People go back and forth about needing all the services. Um, so medications, um, methadone's probably the old, well, naltrexone's pretty old too. Methadone and naltrexone are probably the oldest. Um, methadone is for opioid use disorders. It's it's got its pro, like all of these have their pros and cons. And for each individual person, like they get to decide what's best for them. Um, methadone is controlled in a way that is really tricky. Um, the Nixon administration set up some very specific regulations about how and who can be a methadone prescriber um, for addiction, not for treating things like pain. But if to use methadone for addiction, you have to like follow some very, very specific and very hard to get approval policies to start a methadone clinic. Um, buprenorphine is a little easier. Um, primary care providers can provide methadone to, or buprenorphine to folks. Um, methadone and buprenorphine are for opioid use disorders pretty exclusively, although there is some research saying if it can help with other things. Um, naltrexone is approved, naltrexone is a new opioid blocker, um, and it's approved for both alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorders. They're all good medicine. Um, we try and steer people to medicine because medicine is helpful um, when we can, because being on medicine and not using street drugs is very much safer than being on street drugs. Um, I wish... I wish the FDA had control of our heroin supply. We would at least know what was in it and how strong it was. Um, we don't. And so being on something that we know is safe and not contaminated is a huge harm reduction move. Um, naloxone. Naloxone is my favorite thing in the entire world. Um, <laughs> For people who don't know, naloxone is a medication you can give someone if they are currently not breathing because of opioids. So opioids do, just naturally, opioids make you breathe less often and less deep. And not breathing is bad. Um, we need air in our brains. And so one of the main, the main cause of why people die from an opioid overdose is because they're not getting enough air. Um, naloxone, essentially just like knocks the opioids off the opioid receptors and blocks it for about an hour, um, which allows your body to like process out some of the drugs so you don't stop breathing again once the naloxone wears off. Um, it's, it's amazing medicine. Um, I have personally administered naloxone probably close to 40 times. I would have to count. I have a pile of bottles on my desk that I keep. I keep the bottles when I use them. Um, and people go from being unconscious and not breathing and blue to talking to you in a matter of moments. Um, it's really magical medication. Oh, there's a timer on that slide. Um, it's really powerful. Most states at this point, you can get naloxone. Um, there's not it's not federally mandated on how states can have access, but I believe all 50 states, you can get naloxone if you are um, without a prescription of some sort. Um, but I, I saw there was a lot of places from a lot of people, a lot of different um, places people are coming from for this talk. So I don't wanna talk specifically about any one spot's restrictions, but um, it is becoming much more widely available throughout the country. I encourage anyone who's working with people who use substances to make sure both the people who are using substances have the medication with them, um, as well as like if you are working with folks, it's not a bad idea to keep your keep some yourself. I mean, I carry it in my handbag. Um, it's a safe medication. 
it's helpful. It comes in both the injectable form that you see here. There's also um, a nasal spray, which is a little easier to use. It's also more expensive. Um, there's also an auto injector, which is also um, FDA approved for lay response that exists in the world. So there are options. If there are more specific questions, I can answer them after. I think I got like two or three more slides left and then we'll just open it up for conversation. Um, so like the tools of syringe access, naloxone, like the tools we've talked about already, me medicine, those are like pretty standard for harm reduction programs at this point. Um, the next couple of things I'm going to talk about are um, going to be stuff that are like emerging harm reduction techniques, maybe um, some things that, you know, we're seeing and we're using and different programs are playing with and adopting um going forward so fentanyl surveillance and fentanyl testing so um just to kind of like frame this where it is and to explain what we're talking about when we're talking about fentanyl so when i'm talking about fentanyl when probably most likely when the news is talking about fentanyl when we're talking about fentanyl in the illicit drug supply we're talking about something called illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Um, IMF is an acronym that is sometimes used. Um, that is not a specific substance. Um, it's It can be a lot of different substances. Um, I think most recently we're at like 20 different types of fentanyl that have been identified in drug supplies. Like, because these drugs are being manufactured in labs, there science is really hard. Like I don't want to assume ill will from anyone, but science is really hard. And so we're seeing like variation in the types of fentanyl. Some of them have like, I'm not a chemist either, so sorry, but like we're seeing like different little ions added to the molecules that change it a little bit, which also changes how it behaves in our body and behaves in our brain. And so there is a like, I encourage folks to think about fentanyl like more as a class of drugs than a drug. And I think also there's a lot of misconception that like the fentanyl crisis that we are seeing and the rise in overdose due to fentanyl is similar to the early days of the overdose crisis when we were seeing a lot of like prescription opioids being diverted. So pharmaceuticals being diverted and people taking pharmaceuticals illicitly. Those are two things that did happen, but fentanyl is, that's not what this is. Like this isn't doctors over prescribing fentanyl. This is like fentanyl being produced and shipped because it's more potent, you can ship more for cheaper um, because of all kinds of reasons. But um, it is it is considerably more dangerous, I would say, than heroin. One, because it's stronger. Two, because it's like really inconsistent. Um, it's just an ink, like the fentanyl I buy today could be for renal fentanyl. And the fentanyl I buy tomorrow could be car fentanyl. And those two things have two different potencies. And I may not know the difference, um, which just increases your risk for overdosing because it's much harder to use what I know I need to be using if I don't know how strong it is in the first place. Um, so what we're seeing across the country and the most common way that people are testing to see if their substances do have fentanyl in them is the use of fentanyl test strips. Um, these are urine drug tests that we have demonstrated through external research. Um, the focus study in particular out of Hopkins really looked at analyzing if these test strips worked and if they did work, did people change behavior if they knew their substances had fentanyl in it? The answer is yes, they did. And yes, they do. Um, so, they're a pretty cheap tool. They're a pretty inconsistent, well, not inconsistent, in not specific tool. So basically you can test your substances and it will tell you, yes, it has some kind of fentanyl in it or no, it does not. It does not tell you how much, it does not tell you what kind, it doesn't tell you 
if there's anything else in there other than um, the fentanyl, but it is, but they're a buck a piece, so I can give them out, right? Um, and really help people use them. Um, they're a great tool for testing things like pills, great tool for testing heroin. They're a little less great and a little trickier to use when we're talking about testing things like methamphetamines and MDMA. Um, those, the ratio of water to substance gets a little messier and they're prone to false positives in those situations, but they are, they're a decent tool. Um, more recently, we're seeing harm reduction organizations really pushing for more comprehensive drug checking. So um, a great example is like, and we'll talk about insight coming up, but um, having a mass spectrometer or some other more sophisticated drug checking device. Um, and I'm definitely not an expert on drug checking devices, um, but maybe someday I will be. Um, but these are like devices where people can bring in their substances and I will be able to tell you what's in it and how much of it is in it, um, which really allows people to make better and safer decisions about what they put in their body and what they choose to use and what they choose, like, and how they choose to use substances. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that like we test someone's substance positive for fentanyl and they're like, okay, I'm not going to do that at all. But what we do see is people being like, oh, I know my heroin has fentanyl in it. I'm going to make sure I'm not alone when I use. Um, it's very common if someone tests their supply positive for fentanyl that they refill their naloxone to make sure that they have naloxone with them um, in case something happens. And as we move to more comprehensive um, drug checking and being able to like really fig tease out what is in people's supply, I like I'm a public health nerd. I really like data. Like I'm going to be really curious to look at like how the drug supply changes, what what, ebb, what the ebbs and flows are, um, those kind of things as we start seeing like, is there a difference in the drug supply in Portland, Oregon compared to Chicago? I'm confident there is. That's not an actual real question. It's very different. <laughs> um, but, you know, like really being able to get a sense of like what's actually happening and what the health impacts are. Like if there's some, if drugs are being cut with something benign that doesn't, you know, necessarily lead to overdose, but we're seeing an increase in skin infections because of it. If we're seeing like, you know, other weird health outcomes that, you know, aren't necessarily overdose, those things are important to monitor too. So um, I'm really excited to see what the future holds in terms of drug checking and surveillance going forward. Um, the last concept I'm going to touch on is safe consumption spaces before we open up. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and stuff. But um, so safe consumption spaces, also called overdose prevention sites, also called safe injection facilities. I think Seattle's got like comprehensive health. They've got a name that starts with a C. Um, these things are called a lot of things. Um, these places, these are, this is a harm reduction tool where people can bring substances that they are using into a space and use um, a news with supervision, trained staff. Um, there's a lot of different models that are happening globally. There's over 200 um, legally operating safe consumption spaces across the planet. Um, there are currently no legal safe consumption spaces operating in the United States. Although there's a lot of movement in many places to kind of get these things happening. Um, there is, so like globally, these spaces are like, they're really flexible, right? The first safe consumption space was in Bern um, in 1983. It operated out of, actually out of an ambulance. Um, and it was created to address hepatitis B actually, which is something we don't talk about a lot. Um, thank you vaccines. Um, we don't talk about hepatitis B in terms of injection related illness as much anymore, but um, yeah, people who bring their drugs in, they would use in a clean, safe environment. There are places where you can wash your hands, wash your arms, wash your skin to prevent skin and soft tissue infections. 
pretty much universally, they have sharps containers, so you dispose of your injection equipment on site, so it's not left in the community. And then if something does happen and somebody does overdose, there are people around to be helpful. Um, it's not a new concept and it's like kind of a common sense one in my mind, um, but it is still considered something that's quite controversial um, in the US at least. Um, there is, in the literature, there is one site that is operating somewhere in the United States that has been operating for over five years now. Um, it is not legal, um, but there, it's been operating for five years in a city in the United States. And, you know, I think it's really important to think about when we think about these places, like they've been operating for literally going on 40 years and there's never been a death in an overdose prevention site, safe consumption space, whatever you want to call them, documented. People don't die in these spaces. Um, it's Insight was the first, um, which goes back to, so that first slide where the guy was holding the needle and like protesting in the street, the van dude photo, um, that was a protest to like get safe consumption spaces, safe injection facilities up and running in Vancouver um, for a long time, Insight, which is the name of the program. It's also the bottom picture here. That's a picture of the inside, inside of um, Insight. It was the only operating safe consumption space in North America for a very, very long time. I think they're coming up on their 20th anniversary of operating. Um, and it's also probably one of the most researched um, safe consumption spaces. There's plenty and plenty of papers that show that overdose prevention sites are effective in reducing HIV, hepatitis, overdose, decreasing crime, decreasing addiction rates, increasing access to recovery support services, like all of the outcomes. Um, it really, they really are an effective harm reduction tool. And I know people often think about it as being kind of radical, um, but, you know, like I operate a syringe exchange now, and if I was running a safe consumption space, like the only differences between what we do here in our syringe exchange and what happens in a safe consumption space, like the real crux of the difference is instead of me sitting down and providing people resources and tools and education and like things like that around their use, and then I have to tell them, and now I need you to go three blocks away and use on the freeway overpass where there's no running water, where you're alone if something happens. Um, whereas in a space like this, I could do all the things that I'm doing now. And then I could be like, okay, go to your booth. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if I can offer help. Um, and like, it's really not that different from what we do already except for the fact that we're not sending people off to use on their own. Um, this is just my reminders of things to talk about. And really like that's, that's all the slides I have. And I'm really curious to know what questions you all have for me, or if this was not at all what you wanted it to be, and there's something else that you want me to talk about. Um, I'm really open to hearing what questions you have and trying to answer them. Hi, Haven. Thank you so much for your presentation. We do have some questions in the Q&A box. Great. So I am taking a look at those right now. And I'm going to ask them out of order because one just came in that is relevant to what you were just talking about, about those safe consumption spaces. This is from Marlene. Is there ever a question of safety in those safer consumption spaces? How is that handled? I'm thinking about the folks I know who may act aggressively or violently under the influence. Yeah, I mean, so that people, people sometimes act poorly, um, right? And I think that like, in general, I guess like there are lots of substances that make people act aggressively. Um, alcohol being documentally probably the worst in terms of like alcohol related violence. Um, 
I think that, you know, and we see it anytime you're working with people, there is a threat of violence. People who use drugs are not inherently any more dangerous than people who don't use drugs. Same with like the idea that people with mental health disorders aren't inherently more dangerous than people in general, right? Um, De-escalation training, I think is really important for people working directly with people, period. Actually, I was gonna say people like, De-escalation training is important for people working with people who use drugs, um, but I'm just going to say de-escalation training is good for all of us, right? Anytime you're working with people, having some skills around how to de-escalate tension can be really helpful. Um, and I don't want to like downplay that like people who are traumatized sometimes don't have the same amount of like emotional keys on their emotional keyboard. Mm -hmm. And so like, like maybe embarrassed and act really mad, right? Like, or things like that. But I think, you know, really just anytime you're dealing with the public, like there is like a chance that somebody could escalate and de having good de-escalation skills is really helpful. Um, I would say also like staffing ratios are really important, right? Like um, I, I don't love days when I'm the only staff person in our serenity shades program. I don't. Um, just as like no one should like days when they're the only person in a public facing position. Um, we prefer to have at least two staff. Pre-pandemic, it was up to like three or four staff. Um, our space is really small. So if we're gonna have clients in our space, we have to limit how many staff are in the space just for safety purposes around COVID. But um, yeah, I like I don't have any solid data on like violence and overdose prevention sites. Um, but again, I would kind of push back on the idea that somehow these spaces are more dangerous than say a bar, which is also actually if we think about it, like going to a bar that is a safe consumption space, right? That's a space where you can go and you can consume a very dangerous drug, one that kills more people than drug, all drugs, all their drugs combined, except for cigarettes. Um, we'll take cigarettes out of that equation. Um, but you can go and then there's someone there to make sure you're not be drinking too much alcohol, that like someone can be like, I'm, and, and we're done serving you. Um, like that if you start, showing dangerous symptoms can intervene. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Haven. And I see an, another question related to those safe consumption spaces, this time from Saeed. What is the estimated number of individuals nationwide that are taking advantage of those safe consumption spaces? What is so the portion of drug users who are potential users of safe consumption spaces, but do not have access to such spaces. So in the United States, there are no legally operating safe consumption spaces, right? So <laughs> the, when our numerator is zero, our do not like, like having that like idea of like, we don't know how many people are injecting drugs ever, right? Like we can get some estimates. We can like, try and figure it out. Um, I would argue most of our surveys around like drugs and drug use aren't going to give us a good baseline on how many people actually use injection drugs. Um, in part because of the stigma surrounding drug use, right? Like if I am someone who only uses heroin three times a year, um, which I know plenty of people who do use drugs in those ways, right? That is using heroin for fun. Um, it's not a problem in my life. I probably am not going to disclose that anywhere, right? It's not affecting my life. No one needs to know. And I know I'm going to get judged for it. Um, so I, you know, having those denominators of like, how many people do we need these to serve? I don't know. Um, here in the U.S., we don't have any legally operating. Um, um, the somewhere site because we don't know where it is, we can't, like we know how many people are accessing the somewhere site, 
but we don't know again the denominator because we don't even know what city it is or at least no one will tell um <laughs> it's <laughs> we, we keep it a secret for a reason um so it's really hard to know what the need is for a space like this um that said I mean, I have done surveys of our participants and whether or not they would use one if they had one. And pretty universally, people are like, yeah, I would like that. Um, at least some of the time, right? Um, I think using drugs is really personal. It's a like really personal, really private thing that people do. And most everyone would prefer to use drugs at home. Right. Um, but if you don't have a home, you're going to use in public. Right. Um, and so, and people don't want to use in public. Right. Like, I kind of think about it as like going to the potty. Right. I would much rather do my potty time in my own house, in my own bathroom with the door. Um, but I'll use a public toilet if I have to. And if things are real bad and I don't have access to that, I will go outside, right? Because it's a it's something that, that has to happen. And I think with, you know, when someone's really dope sick, like they're gonna do what they can to get well. Um, and so by providing people like a safe place to do that in, it like people are really like interested in using spaces like this because again they don't want like the amount of shame i hear in our clients voices when they talk about getting caught using or like i like it comes up a lot like a kid saw me shooting up and people feel terrible about that um and part of it is like we want them like we have this like weird handoff going, right? Like people want to hide so that people don't see them and people don't judge them and people don't treat them poorly. And so they don't get arrested, but they know if they hide too well and something happens to them that no one's gonna find them and no one's gonna be able to help them. And so like, it's this weird, messy dichotomy and like balancing act that people are doing whereas if they have a space that they can come then they don't have to worry about hiding or being alone or those kind of things did that work yeah yes thank you haven we've got a couple more questions here and these are kind of from throughout the presentation, not just uh, related to safe consumption spaces. So the first I'll read is, has the decriminalization law with regard to psychedelics given you hope? So are you, I'm assuming you're talking about Oregon. Um, one, I am one of the most hopeful people you will ever meet in <laughs> your entire life. Um, I just, I really believe in the power like you don't work in this field for this long and see so much positive change for the people like the people I'm working with. Like people are constantly learning and growing and changing behavior and like being more healthy. And like, it's really beautiful. Like people often say things like, oh, it must be so depressing to work with people who use drugs. And I'm like, it, it's absurd to me because like one, our folks are amazing. They're hilarious and engaging and resilient and beautiful. And like, I, I like some of my best friends are former syringe exchange clients, right? Like people that I like, like consider like my besties are people who were getting services from me at one point in time. Um, met, we became friends many years after I do have boundaries. Um, <laughs> to be clear, I do have boundaries, but you know, like if you believe in like recovery, then eventually like you're, you have to like, let go of the fact that yes, you were a client 10 years ago. And now you're a colleague, you work at a partner organization or whatever. Um, so it, I am very hopeful. When it comes to decram, 
which like, I think it's amazing. I, I mean, I think if we're talking specific around psilocybin and psychedelics, like I think that the therapeutic, um, like prospect of what those medications can hold for folks is really fascinating. I'm, I am a data nerd, so I want to see the data before I say whatever, but I also like am pro people putting things in their bodies that they want in their bodies and that that should be okay. And if someone tells me taking psilocybin helps my depression, helps my PTSD, helps my whatever, like who am I to tell them the wrong? Placebo effect is real and I'm, I'm pro placebo effect. Um, <laughs> like, but placebo will do it, get it done. Um, I just want you to be happier and healthier, right? And so, yeah, I think that that is all very, very helpful. I think, you know, decriminalizing all substances, which is what we did here in Oregon is huge. I think it's too early to tell outcomes, right? It just happened. I think, I also think it's gonna be really hard to measure outcomes in general with how complicated and messy everything is that is happening right now. Like, you know, addiction rates are skyrocketing um, because of the pandemic, you know, relapse rates are up. I think like teasing out the confounding factors on what was measure 110 and what was um, at anything else um, is gonna be really challenging. Um, again, because I'm a data nerd, I like thinking about those things. But um, I do have a lot of hope that things are gonna get better, right? I We're seeing like investments at a federal level um, in addiction and recovery supports and harm reduction supports in a way that we've never seen before. Um, we're seeing a lot of policy changing that embraces harm reduction in a way it never did. Um, there's some really amazing changes that happened due to the respiratory pandemic of COVID-19 that hopefully stick around, right? Like the ability to be able to provide, like eh, not just provide, provide and bill for, um, you know, like telehealth services around addictions. Like that wasn't a thing that we could do pre-pandemic. And so, and like having that ability increases access for everyone. So I really, I really am actually quite, like as hard as this work is and as much as like my heart breaks so often. And I mean, it's several times a month I learned someone I know dies. Um, I I do believe that it's it's getting better. Um, not necessarily the health outcomes aren't necessarily getting better yet, but like the acceptance and the movement, and we know what to do around these things, and that's getting better. Um, I've been doing this work for a very 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 long time, and you know it. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have been invited to come and cover this topic in this forum, to be honest. Um, 10 years ago, I was fighting my way into the like Oregon Health Authority to like get my way into meetings around HIV. And like, it wasn't as like, the acceptance of the work I do is very, very different now than it was before. And I, I with as many people that are excited and passionate and are coming into this work, I really think we're gonna see the tides turn where Finally, harm reduction is considered part of the continuum of care for people, that people who are using substances will be able to get what they need to survive in a really clear way. Thank you, Haven. Really appreciate the, the hope and the insight that you bring to this. We've got about seven minutes left for Q&A. There are a couple of questions I want to uh, read out for you here. The first is a two-part question from Saeed. Do we know what amount slash portions the federal and state budgets are devoted to harm reduction efforts and services? And to what local agencies are the funds channeled through to reach providers and clients slash patients? You can give an example of Oregon and any states you are familiar with. Thank you. No, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> so what proportion of federal funds go to harm reduction? I literally have no clue. Um, most of it comes through like different grant. So one of the things I love about harm reduction that is different than healthcare 
is harm reduction looks at an individual and their whole person and their whole person self. The federal government doesn't fund whole person health. They fund interventions to lower overdose rates, to lower HIV rates. So like all of the funding that I get for my program, which is all I can really speak to very well, is HIV prevention money, overdose prevention money, and recently some Measure 110 money. Because um, Measure 110, our decrim bill also in, put investment, use marijuana tax or cannabis, sorry, correction, cannabis tax revenue to um, fund um, services for people who use substances. Um, historically, the federal government didn't spend a lot of money on harm reduction at all. It's only actually been in the last year that the federal government allowed us to use federal funds to buy syringes. Um, like harm reduction programs could use, for a long time it was banned. You couldn't use any federal dollars to fund any like harm reduction services across the board. Um, I think it was 2013. 12, 2000, don't quote me on the date, 2012, 2013. If someone knows, you can drop it in the chat um, that we were finally allowed to use federal funds for harm reduction services. However, we were explicitly forbidden for using any of those funds to buy syringes. That just got lifted under Biden. So like, <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so I would argue a very small proportion of federal funds go to harm reduction services. And I think when it comes to states and local, like I, government funding, I think it's really varied. Like I, I know it's very varied, right? <laughs> um, just because of the acceptance of harm reduction services in different places. Um, Portland, Oregon, again, what we were the first, the exchange I run was the first publicly funded syringe exchange in the country. Um, so we've been getting, we started in 1989, we get funds from the, actually multiple county health departments as well as state funding. Um, but there are a lot of harm reduction programs that get zero tax funding. Um, there's lots of programs that are running on like t-shirt sales or do and donations and in kind kinds of things um, to operate. And kudos to those guys, because I can't design cute t-shirts. This patch on this slide, very cute. I have it on a t-shirt. That's from Iowa, um, the um, Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, but I don't know, did that answer both parts of that question? Did that, I mean, the answer is I really couldn't tell you. Yeah, I think I think you addressed them both, Haven, and provided some good um, context as well, too. And we have one more question, and I believe this is referring to the uh, time where you were talking about the fentanyl testing strips. This is from Bridget. I would love to know the research behind the positive behavioral effect of testing. Good news. Can you say it one more time? Sure. Uh, I would love to know the research behind the positive behavioral effect of testing. So, yeah. Okay. So I hope, I mean, it could, that also could be about HIV testing. Oh, sure. Um, so in terms of um, fentanyl testing and drug checking, um, that comes out of a study um, out of Baltimore, I think it was Baltimore, Rhode Island and somewhere else. I know Baltimore and Rhode Island. Um, it's called the FOCUS study, um, comes out of Hopkins. I can send it to somebody if they want to. You can email me and I can send you the link. Um, but basically what they did is they were first and foremost validating whether or not the test strips worked in real life. And then also did some um, qualitative interviews with people who use drugs. Um, during the course of testing to look at what behaviors people were interested in changing based on um, their substance use. Mm -hmm. HIV data around testing, like that, if that is what the question was intending, there's plenty of studies that show that just the act of testing does change behaviors. It's really mixed on how long 
that dose effect lasts, mm-hmm. right? Like um, some, like most of them are pretty short. So like in the three months after you had a test, did your risk behaviors change? Um, three months is a pretty short dose response. Um, if we're using that terminology, which is again, like that's like study talk. Um, but like if I get tested and I say I'm going to use condoms and I use them for the first three months, doesn't necessarily like, just because I got tested then doesn't mean that a year from now, I'm still going to be engaging in that behavior. So, um, how long it lasts is variable, but it is really clear that like if someone tests positive for a viral infection, like for any infection for that matter, curing them also is a really important thing that will help prevent the spread of future infection. Thank you, Haven. And I misspoke when I said that was the last question. Great. This one has a couple parts to it. And the <sighs> participant asking it is also open to being followed up with in the future as well. This question is from Racha Luz. Using one of your posted harm reduction principles, would you be able to share how that principle can potentially promote tremendous efforts to develop one or two innovative solutions for social work grand challenge initiative to advance long and productive lives in Alaska? On continuum of care, I'm interested in promoting sober transition services in support of areas of workforce development and customized employment activities. You can send me helpful feedback or related links. I understand we're pressed for time in this uh, webinar. No rush, okay. I appreciate the opportunity to reach out and connect. Great, I would love, um, I'm gonna try and see, I don't actually see this question. It's in, uh, it's showing up in the answered because I responded to it. Okay. And I'm happy to copy this question and email it to you, Haven, too, which has this person's contact information as well. I would love that. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. I think I just found it. I want to just try and answer a little bit of this. Um, Great. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, I... I don't know why this question is feeling very hard for me right now. Um, So, I mean, I think in terms of like all things like substance related, like really centering the individuals you're working with Mm -hmm. is one of the most important things you can do, right? And like making sure that like, people have access to the tools and the services that they need to to be healthy and to be productive in whatever way they define, right? I think that like when we're talking about, like it's easy for us to get fixated on what we want the goal to be Mm -hmm. um, and what like I would love. Mm for people to never use drugs again, right? Or people who want to not use drugs to like not use. And I know that everyone's health, like the safest way to do drugs is to not do them, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's just true. But if that's the only goal, then that takes away a lot of like, autonomy. Like, I don't get to decide what the goal is for folks. That's not my job. Right. Um, you know, like I often talk about my smoking because I know it's bad for me and because I'm not ashamed that I smoke either. Um, which is something I've been told I should be as a health, as a public health person, as somebody who works in healthcare, I get shamed about my smoking a lot. Um, and you know, should the, like, Should the goal be me never smoking cigarettes again? Should that be a goal? Probably. It's actually kind of a goal I personally would like. Um, And I will honestly say there are times cigarettes have saved my life, right? Like full on, I have been suicidal and said, 
I'm going to finish these last three cigarettes and then kill myself. And in the time it took me to smoke those three cigarettes, I had like moved to a still wasn't in a great place. Let's be honest, but it was in a less dangerous place. Um, you know, I really believe that it's unethical to take away someone's coping skills, right? Like if someone is using substances to cope with whatever they're using, mm -hmm. it is not ethical to take away that skill from someone until they have other ones. Um, I've lost several clients who were pressured and coerced into treatment, whether through law enforcement coercion, through family coercion, who got out of treatment and died by suicide within six months um, because they didn't have those coping skills yet to deal with that. And so I think we need to be very careful about like how we define what the outcome is for folks. And for me, it's always happy, healthy, and not dead. Those, those are what I'm looking for. Happy, healthy, not dead. Um, so I will follow up with this question. Um, if you can email that to me, that would be helpful. Um, so, cause I, I don't think I actually answered the question at all. I just got on a soapbox about what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> and so I will, I will get that question to you. Thank you. Haven. I will follow up and I want to thank you again so much for your presentation and your insight and your passion for doing the work that you do and also sharing about it today with all of us. So we're about at time. So wanted to make sure that everyone saw the evaluation link that is in the chat. Your feedback is important, and this helps to share your input as well as help us to plan for future sessions. So thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes to fill out that uh, evaluation survey in the chat. And also wanted to make sure that everyone knew where you can find out more information and register for additional resources. You know, we watch this recording as well in the future. See other future training opportunities at www.mhttcnetwork.org forward slash Northwest. That's also where you can sign up to get the newsletter, email us with any questions, or find us on social media. So thank you all so much for being here with us today. Big thank you again to Haven. And we really appreciate everyone taking the time today to learn more about harm reduction. This really is a very critical topic and we hope to see you again soon. So thank you so much for being here. And we will close the webinar shortly. So please uh, remember to click that evaluation link out of the chat box in Haven. We're also seeing lots of appreciation for you in the chat. You know, people saying thank you, really seeing your passion and, you know, sharing about the importance of harm reduction. So I wanted to make sure you uh, knew there was all that goodness happening in the chat. <laughs> all right. With that, we are going to close the webinar. Thank you so much for being here.